Hello, welcome to Virtual Concert Hall's live music channel. My name is Chris Au, and I have with me the amazing co-founder of Virtual Concert Hall's, Dr. Anna Ospenskaya. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I can't wait to dive into the first symphony of Beethoven. That's correct. This is part one of the documentary of Beethoven's Symphony Number no. One, written and narrated by Lawrence Rapchak, created by New Media Productions Worldwide and Virtual Concert Halls, and produced by the Architects of Music. And I wanted to remind everyone that this incredible collaboration has been possible because of our shared passion for bringing music and musicians in real time together in musical performances, events, and programs like this from around the globe. Beethoven arrived in Vienna in November 1792, not quite 22 years old. Mozart had died 11 months earlier, and Haydn had just returned from his first superstar residency in London. Vienna was the place to be for a young musician like Beethoven, who was known as a promising composer, but a pianist of the first rank, with a phenomenal talent for improvisation, creating musical fantasies on the spot as he played. But his talent for real composition had barely been tapped at this young age. That would take more time, more study, more development. Beethoven, born in December of 1770 and raised in Bonn, Germany. His grandfather Ludwig was the local Kapellmeister or music director, a powerful and influential man who died when Beethoven was only three. Beethoven's father, Johann, also was a court musician, but fate seems to have skipped a generation in terms of real talent, since Johann was merely competent. He also became known as a heavy drinker and something of a local character. Not surprisingly, Johann tended to take out his own failures on his son, Ludwig, our guy, and was a strict, unyielding, and even cruel teacher, and was especially intolerant of young Ludwig's skill at improvisation. Parental jealousy, I imagine. Anyway, Beethoven's unhappy childhood tended to drive him inward, withdrawing from society into his own fantasy world. But fortunately, Beethoven impressed a number of important musicians and aristocrats in Bonn who would help pave the way for his introduction into Viennese musical life. Beethoven also became a student of the Enlightenment and immersed himself in history, theology, literature, science, and philosophy, especially the rather remote time and space philosophy of Immanuel Kant and the lofty idealism of the poet Friedrich Schiller. A pretty potent combination. And from an early age, we find that Beethoven was drawn to Schiller's popular Masonic poem known as On die Freude, Ode to Joy, which he filed away for possible future use. Beethoven had little problem attracting financial support from wealthy patrons in Vienna. But the main reason he was there was to study composition with the master, Franz Josef Haydn, which he did for just over a year. It was a rather controversial, at times contentious relationship. And despite those who like to pile on Haydn and claim that Beethoven learned nothing from him, Haydn's influence on Beethoven was profound, especially, I feel, Haydn's great symphony number 102. Haydn's technique of motivic repetition to create drama and fortify the structure of the music surely impressed the young Beethoven. That's Haydn's Symphony 102, which is part of this series. Haydn definitely helped guide the young Beethoven in marshalling his creative powers into music of cohesion, invention, and architectural proportion. And then, 
there's this. A most striking but subtle announcement to the musical world. Odd that the most titanic musical mind of the century avoided the grand, heaven-storming, dramatic gesture to impress his audience. Beethoven clearly felt he didn't need that and wisely decided not to overdo it. But whatever his thinking, here it is again. The dawn of the new century, which fueled Beethoven's creative powers as he now shifted into high gear, producing piano sonatas, concerti, his first string quartets, his famous septet, and his first symphony, a form that every serious composer had to tackle. And it might be surprising to learn that there were very few established public concerts at this time in Vienna. Orchestras were still the property of the royalty. And even though this had started to change, a composer still had to organize and fund his own concerts in order to hear his large-scale works. These concerts were called academies. Mozart did them often. It's astounding to think that the greatest symphonic and choral masterworks of all time were only heard by audiences because the composer himself went out and raised the money, including the premiere of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony in 1824. Yeah, that one, yes. So generous support of wealthy patrons was essential, and in that regard, Beethoven was well-served and well-connected, but he still had to sell tickets out of his apartment for his own first big Academy concert which took place on Wednesday, April 2nd, 1800, his real coming out into society. And since these events showcased a composer's new output but could only be produced occasionally, they were usually very long concerts, jammed full of as-yet-unheard music. So the final offering in this big concert was Beethoven's new First Symphony, maybe a bit cautious in its musical idiom, maybe not. Still, Beethoven honors tradition by opening the symphony with a slow introduction, as did Haydn. But to announce yourself to the musical world in such an understated, almost offhand way was remarkable, so unconventional, even a bit revolutionary. The audacity of those two chords is, I think, the first of many such features that we will encounter in Beethoven's symphonies. Since when does a work begin? with an unresolved chord, a dominant chord. We call it dominant seventh because of this interval is seven notes apart. And the dominant chord must lead to the tonic or the home key. It's that old polarity thing that must resolve. Dominant, tonic. And you always start with your tonic, your home key chord, not the unresolved dominant. When I demonstrated this with Rossini, There, that one, that chord, you certainly can't end with it. And you can't start out of the blue with it either. Certainly not in 1800. Yet, there it is. And with total confidence, Beethoven continues now with two more similar cadences. This one shifting to the minor key. And the third of them now, like so leading to this. Aha, and we finally got our bearings, and we've arrived emphatically now in G major. Ta-da! There's only one problem, and that's the symphony is based in C major. G is the dominant, the polar key, and it must resolve G to C. Okay, so Beethoven now writes a lovely lyrical melody to bring us out of G and into C major. chords. Now it pulls back just a bit and moves into the minor. But then it crescendos and reaffirms the glorious C major. It's filled with G oh, in the bass. Here's an ascending scale. 
which now quickly returns downward. And presto, or allegro con brio, our exposition begins. Wow, and with that, we've kick-started <laughs> the first symphony, the first part of the first symphony. Amazing. That's right, and I love how um, Lawrence Rapchak introduces us to the scene, to the background of um, yeah. where that symphony came from and um, what was Beethoven's background. I mean, if you go to any study on Beethoven's biography, you have to read through pages and pages and pages and pages and pages, and pages, and pages to it's get true. to the point where she uh, went to Vienna. And um, it's incredible how Lawrence has that insight at um, finding and bringing to our attention the um, facts and the events of Beethoven's life and uh, who he met, how he met, people, what he took from that, and who was, what, what was his social life, what was his standing, what was his approach, and uh, puts it in a fleeting couple of minutes of yeah. just a brief introduction, brings us, immerses us in that moment, in that uh, time period in which Beethoven was writing and preparing for his big entrance on the scene with the first uh, monumental work of that scope. Uh, yeah, so let's take some time to summarize for everybody. So we have this uh, grandfather, a Kapellmeister, so renowned, respected musician. And then it skips a generation, obviously, <laughs> because Johann uh, Beethoven was a court musician, but merely competent, you know, a, a bit of a bit of a heavy drinker, local character, <laughs> and a strict and unyielding father, apparently. So we know from that already the summary of Beethoven's background and who he was and that picture of Beethoven we saw he's a quite a handsome young man and so he goes off to Vienna at the age of about 22 or so and he studies with Haydn for a while and here we are producing the first symphony at opus 21 which means that he's already composed at least 21 significant pieces of music to be published before he puts his first symphony down the first That's right. stamp, yeah. That's right. He already composed uh, large works, like large, large programmed works, like um, sonatas for piano and trios, and uh, a lot of uh, compositions already were published and out there um, before the the symphony he even started considering and uh, writing that symphony. And interesting, uh, another interesting fact about Beethoven <clears throat> earning his reputation as uh, an improviser, so uh, yeah. as a virtuoso pianist who sat down at the piano and impressed um, everyone around by being able to improvise on the spot. Um, and that also um, kind of um, turns things around and explains his standing, the social standing, which was extremely important then, and I want to say it's as important, the networking is important today, of course, in, in different way. But back then, that was crucial because um, Beethoven had to not only compose the symphony, not only prepare it for publication and do all the copies for all the musicians, he had to do fundraising in order for that symphony to be performed. That's a very important, interesting fact. So at 20 something, Beethoven was not only composing at this level, he was already an entrepreneur <laughs> organizing yeah. and probably that fundraising effort took him just as long as writing the symphony. That's incredible that you think about uh, artists and composers these days who may be complaining, oh, I'm not getting enough concerts, not people enough, not enough people preparing my works, and yet these people, this Beethoven, this legend of our time, is raising money to get his music performed uh, in big public concerts. Because not to forget that, and Larry Rapchak highlights this, it's most concerts were for the aristocrats. So the, to actually have concerts for the bigger public, to get everybody in a big space, meant you really had to fundraise and do it all on your own. So you could get the music heard, and then you get the newspapers talking about it, the people talking about it. You know, you get this idea that Beethoven was a composer for the people, because he wanted many people to listen to his music. And so it requires so much to just get this first symphony out, not just the composition part of it, but the fundraising and the frustration with the musicians and rehearsing everything. 
Well, he had to also um, cast the musicians. You know, yeah. nowadays you go to a symphony hall and it's you take it for granted. There is there is a symphony orchestra. Someone over there on their staff is organizing their sheet music, their stands, yeah. their lights in the hall. Beethoven had to do all of it himself. Yes. Yeah. That emphasizes to me just how uh, entrepreneurial you have to be as a musician and to put everything together. Uh, what's really incredible, and as we see this with Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 1, is that he starts off with a bang. And he starts off with something that's really incredible so that um, people on the first hearing is just hearing uh, this dominant seventh chord. This dominant seventh is what begins this whole piece. And we also notice that it doesn't resolve to C major, it resolves to F major to begin with. And then he goes into talking about, okay, 5, 7 of C to 7. So, and then piece hasn't even started yet, and we're already full of surprises, full of things. And Anna, as, as someone who's played a lot of Beethoven, how often is it that you start a piece of music by Beethoven and you have no idea where it's going to go, and that it's just a whole journey from the beginning, the first note? Yeah, that's incredible that he started his um, cycle of nine symphonies, which he didn't know he was going to compose nine of them. Yeah, uh, that's that's true. But he started that journey into the uh, monumental um, works, programmed works of symphonies with the dominant seventh chord. I don't know, Chris, if you if you know of another symphony which starts with a dominant seventh and then goes to another dominant seventh and goes to another dominant seventh chord. These are uh, the the unstable chords which require a resolution and uh, he doesn't even start it in the original key of the symphony. Um, this is very innovative. Um, yeah. I, d I don't know another symphony, do you? No, I, I, I really don't. And not only that, but even the piano works or any of the other big pieces of music we have, um, you don't often find it wandering in a key before really entering it, finally. A lot of the time it announces the key and that's where we go. You know, it's that's like, right. um, we always often think about structurally, the beginning of the piece is your home. We're starting from home, you know, and, and it's not very often that in terms of the narrative of a piece, you start off with somebody away from home and have them to figure it out before finally, ah, here we are. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's what's quite special about this piece, that the introduction of the piece itself is in a way wandering and finding its way to the real proper start of the piece. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's very interesting that Beethoven chose um, yeah. to start that way and uh, uh, gives us an insight into where he was at the moment, at the time. He was a very young 20-something and uh, definitely he was in search of his own voice and uh, at that time he even denied that um, there was a, a tremendous influence on in his writing and his perception and his way of uh, composing from Haydn, with whom he studied for one year. Yeah. Um, he he was definitely trying to shed all the dependencies on previous geniuses and uh, trying to really establish his own standing in the genre, on the music scene, and as a, a composer of a unique um, statue. Yeah, that's really quite a sensational thing. And I want to remark just how incredible it is that we have uh, Larry to talk about all this music and the video editors to put all this together because it really brings to life what he has to say. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time or have seen some of our programs, we try to include as much of the score as possible so that those who are musicians or music lovers can see how it's constructed. And as you can see, it's complex. You know, he takes a little while and what I love is how he begins. You know, you, you, it, it's this incredible allegro con brio. You know, got this like sort of very elusive, and this is why we chose the sunrise as a way because uh, to depict this symphony. Then you you find yourself wondering where the sun is going to rise, what's going to happen, and then within a very short span of time, he goes yada da da, 
da, da, da. and it's just this amazing energy that brings to life something beautiful and C major is such a special key to Beethoven and it symbolizes a lot of rebirth a lot of new beginnings a, a, as of being reborn and I think that's what it is that this symphony even though it's such a big monumental task for him it's not a sense of dread it's not something that he's wor worrying about it's very different to how Brahms starts his first symphony oh, yeah yeah right <laughs> he took like 24 years to compose that first symphony yeah and, um, and Brahms' the first... intimidation by the previous giants was very evident through that process Beethoven was not um, intimidated not one bit he would just walked in and started doing his He's own like, thing all right let's Get to get to work. Get to business. And with Brahms's first symphony is he's like he's fighting through the waves of tumultuous rain and torrential downpour. It's crazy. And this sort of Beethoven first symphony has an idea of positive optimism, this triumphant optimism that I think is what really marks the genius of a great composer like Beethoven. Yeah, Beethoven definitely is a manifestation of um, uh, optimism, and uh, he carried that throughout his entire life and throughout his entire um, creative life. And so what we find with Beethoven is this idea that triumph and optimism is what stands, and it's evident from the first symphony you see that and i want to make sure that we highlight that because this whole rest of our series with beethoven's symphony number one all the different parts are in a way signifying okay how can we make sure that this optimism this first stamp of who beethoven is is evident from the very beginning uh it's just really a wonderful way and i'm so happy to share it with you as well as uh to to have commentary alongside Dr. Anna Osmanskaya. I want to make sure we thank our our team and collaborators, uh, New Media Productions, uh, Virtual Concert Halls, as well as Architects of Music and Larry Rabchak for putting this all together and making us such a joy to explore alongside you, Dr. Anna. It's really amazing. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I want to invite everyone who is watching, whether you're watching for the first time or you're a veteran of joining our programs about Beethoven, um, please be aware that we have many other events going on. We are live every day with music and musicians from around the globe. That's a series of presentations of artists, orchestras, opera houses, yeah. and um, various music organizations um, daily and we're presenting different projects, platforms dedicated to music, music education. Um, this is a very interesting show and uh, we hope we join that. We also have many events for musicians where they can audition to various opportunities to perform with orchestras around the world, to perform yeah. at the Carnegie Hall and to present their projects and we always look for more people to join our tent of um, proactive musicians who are taking uh, things in their own hands and promoting and uh, stepping out, uh, putting ourselves out and uh, pr propelling forward um, our careers and our art. So Absolutely. please join us um, on our shows. Um, you can, of course, comment, get in touch with us. And you see on the screen there is a lot of um, websites. Uh, please visit those websites and see what's coming up. We have auditions coming up soon in just three weeks for performances at Carnegie Hall and yes. many, many more events. Amazing. And thank you for joining us today. This is part one of uh, Symphony Number no. 1 written and read about Lawrence Rapchak, produced by the amazing Newbie Productions and Virtual Concert Halls. And stay tuned for part two of our Beethoven 1 documentary series. Hope to see you soon. Take care. Bye now. No matter where you are or who you are, music connects us all. We started with a dream, but now we are paving the future. Welcome to the Sound Espressiva Global Competition. Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes, scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage.